Well, uh, my computer says noon. I don't hear the whistle, but it's a little, uh, uh, not quite as uh, loud each year as my hearing uh, fades away. So we're going to go ahead and uh, and get started here, Mike. And uh, it's, so this is my chance to welcome all of you who have joined us for this uh, monthly webinar. Uh, we're glad to have you with us uh, today. And it's a pretty nice day up here in Wisconsin, and I hope it's a good day wherever you are. Uh, today's webinar, uh, the crop year is over, now what? Always lots of questions this time of the year. We have a lot of our feed made. There's some still out in the field. Forage quality, we may know much, quite a bit about it. We may not know a lot about some of it yet, but to help us sort through all of this um, is our uh, co-host and uh, main presenter, Mike Hutchins from the University of Illinois. The, today's webinar is brought to uh, by Zinpro Performance Minerals. We appreciate their support. We also want to acknowledge uh, Jim Baltz, uh, Mike's co-worker down there at the University of Illinois who makes this all happen uh, from the technical standpoint. And I perhaps should say that I'm Steve Larson uh, with the uh, editorial staff of, here, uh, of Horge Dairyman here. And uh, I'm going to call on Mike now to take it from here. Go ahead, Mike. Well, Steve, thanks very much, and we appreciate that uh, warm welcome. And uh, we also want to thank Zinpro Corporation uh, for their sponsorship and, of course, Hordes Dairyman for their continued interest in bringing these webinars to you. So today, uh, I think our picture pretty much reflects what's going on, at least in Illinois. Uh, we are really bringing the corn in right now, and we're simply saying, now, what are we going to do? And what are you dairy producers? What are you dairy managers? Uh, you nutritionists, your consultants, your veterinarian, what, 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 are, what are we going to do? with it. Well, Steve, I thought it'd be just fun to put one PowerPoint. It kind of captures what we discussed in an earlier uh, program, and that is uh, the 2013 crop year. You know, Steve, we'll kind of let people walk through that, depending if you're in Wisconsin and Minnesota. The number one point was huge. Nearly two million acres of alfalfa winter killed, and those people really had to make some tough decisions last spring. We know uh, delayed planting. Uh, the, the, we just saw a, a news release that came across uh, in the state of Iowa. There, there are three cra corn crops this year, May, June, and and July when it was planted and obviously July is in deep trouble. Uh, very dry areas especially here in the Midwest August September more about that a bit later and then of course uh, the frost and uh, boy we're seeing temperatures now in the 40s and and so in some areas in Minnesota they've had killing frost already and then we have that immature corn that is going to be harvested probably sometime after after a killing frost. We move on. Jim Baltz pulled this together. A little tough to find, isn't it, Jim, with the government shutdown? But uh, corn production, uh, G uh, uh, Steve and, and listeners, are pretty exciting. Take a look at 2012, and you can see this is the, uh, the last uh, statistics we had were September. You can see that line has gone way up, and uh, and it's coming in big. It's coming in big is what we're hearing. So going to be lots of corn, at least compared to 2012, and certainly uh, compared to our, uh, the, the national uh, uh, yield, just, just huge. Huge. Uh, soybeans surprisingly are coming in bigger than we thought. Notice the line. I think, uh, Steve, if we redid this line in October, you're going to see it steeper. Uh, we're going to talk more about what the crop outlook uh, happened here in Illinois a bit later. So you can take a look at that as well. So it looks like we're going to have a pretty big soybean crop as well. The cotton crop is no big surprise. Uh, quite, a, quite a bit of acres went out. You can see the yield is down. And of course, as dairy producers, that's going to impact the availability and price of fuzzy cotton seed. One of our favorite forage extenders that we use especially in years where we're going to be low on forages so again you can see we're back to that almost that 2008 2009 type number so certainly these are some numbers of saying what does the crop look like as of this uh, time period right now Jim found this one which is pretty cool uh, hard to read I mean if you had to get your trifocals on to read it but we see the green area that means that uh, uh, the yield in terms uh, of corn yields were way up and so you can see a lot of uh, color. You don't want to see too much red or orange. That means you got hit. And there are some areas you can see in Wisconsin that appears to be in the orange and parts of Minnesota. So certainly uh, there are areas that are paying prices in terms of corn crops. But the good news, you look at the big I states, Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, southern Wisconsin, uh, pretty much in the green, which means we're going to have some pretty useful type crops coming in. More about that in a minute. 
Here, though, is a sobering one that uh, looks at October 8th of 2013. Uh, had you done this in July, we all of us uh, uh, east of Iowa would be in the white area. Now you can see some areas of drought and drought concerns. Uh, the big concern in Illinois is, is basically a fires potentially in fields with these big combines out there uh, working and a risk of a spark or something that would cause a, uh, create a fire out in the fields itself. So certainly this is a, a going to be a challenge. And then of course this one is pretty sobering for us at least in Illinois and parts of Wisconsin and certainly in the western part of the United States. Uh, this is the uh, tendency for drought for coming into the fall. And you can see we're kind of stuck. Now some areas are going to improve. Uh, some areas are going to be taken off the list. You can see parts of Idaho and Oregon, uh, Western uh, California, where there's going to be some improvement. But this this is going to have some impact down the road potentially next spring, Steve, when we get back and start looking at putting crops in in uh, in uh, April and May and June here in in the Midwest. So uh, these are kind of scary maps and certainly interesting numbers to take a look at. I want to warm, uh, encourage our listeners, and we have a, a nice turnout here uh, today that we'd like to hear from you. So at the end of the webinar, I'm going to call on Steve to give a bit of a Wisconsin recap of kind of what's happening in Wisconsin. I can recap a little bit in Illinois, but if we have some listeners from other parts of the United States, why don't you go ahead and type in kind of what's, what's going on in terms of corn, corn yield, soybeans, uh, what's the crop outlook look like, and some of the attitudes. So we would certainly welcome you to be part of our webinar. And right around uh, 1245, we will read some of those off. Uh, we aren't going to open up the microphones. That can get pretty scary pretty fast. Well, we have a couple survey questions. Let's kind of find out, Jim, what uh, people are thinking. So get ready to vote. All of you understand how hopefully how to do that. If you've been on our program before, you will just click on. And the question is, what will the price of high quality, notice the word high quality there, be in 2014? Uh, choice A, under $200 a ton, B, $200 to $225, C, $250 to $300. Open up the range a little bit, and then I put one over $300. So we're going to let open it up, and we're voting at this point. It looks like we've uh, got uh, what percent? We've got half of you voted oh, already. Excellent. Oh, quick voting today. That's great. Yeah, maybe that bodes well. What's going to happen in D.C. with the uh, with the uh, voting People there? Must have a pretty good idea what this hay is going to cost. That's great. And almost wow. 62, almost two thirds have voted. Yeah. Well, Jim, let's uh, wrap this off and let's uh, share this. Now, will our people see this, Jim? Okay, so you can see that uh, half of you are going to have hay uh, saying somewhere from 250 to $300 a ton. I remember that number a little bit later on. But uh, hay is probably good hay. is going to be a bit marginal and maybe non-existent. And, of course, maybe somebody will want to ask that question, should we take this cutting now here in October if it's out there? And, Steve, we looked at your fields when we were out there at Expo time, and there, there was a lot of green. We had a lot of hay, a lot of haylage, a lot of silage standing out there as well. So we'll move on. Uh, what we did is we went to Rock River Lab. That's one of the three major testing labs here in the Midwest. And we asked them, well, what are you seeing? And we want to thank Rock River for sharing their data. Uh, you can see uh, in the protein levels uh, down a little bit. But what really catches my eye is NDF. Notice the NDF up about three units. So we're kind of falling. You know, a good alfalfa is 20, 30, 40. And we're in trouble on the 20, and we're in big trouble on the 40. So you can see high fiber. And this is fresh material. Uh, that's how they separated on out. Look at the lignin we have sitting in there. That's not a big number, but come down here. Look at this one, Steve. A total track NDF digestibility uh, down, both 30-hour and total track. So really down, really down. So uh, it mirrors that uh, our forage, uh, our alfalfas and grasses look like, especially the first crop, uh, really got hit pretty hard in terms of a quality indices. We also asked Rock River about their corn silage uh, and samples that came in. This is fresh corn silage again. You can see uh, not a big surprise here, except you know, see the starch numbers are back compared to where they were in 2012. So the corn size looks pretty normal. Now remember, this corn silage was coming in by uh, probably the, the first week of October, and so this is some of that early corn silage. I think we'll be surprised, Steve, that these numbers will look a little different if some of us who've uh, still got corn size that was planted in June, that's going to be picked up. I got a feeling the starch numbers will be different. So eyes wide open that uh, while this looks more encouraging than the alfalfa data, certainly, um, you know, it, it, it's going to be variable as well. 
So we have another question, and that is, where is this price of corn going to be in 2014? So, Cole, get your voting hats on again. Uh, under $4 a bushel, that was a hot question at World Dairy Expo. You can see the other numbers, and I will not read them to you. And I went over five fifty a bushel. Some of you say maybe I didn't have a high enough number there, but uh, Jim and I felt that would be a pretty good number. So we're off and running, and uh, Jim, is the polls open? Uh, we have, boy, oh boy, Steve, look at that. Amazing. Lots well, of votes coming in. It is, and uh, ah, there's some pretty bearish people on uh, corn price out there. So. Yeah, I tell you. It's, or it's bullish for dairy if you're buying. <laughs> yeah, you betcha. Well, let's go ahead and close this, Jim. we got almost 75% of the people in, and uh, so you people can see that a majority of you have this corn somewhere between 4 and $5 a bushel, and 10% uh, of you say under 4 under four and uh, we talked to a very good colleague of mine at Ex Expo and he said Mike you will see some corn moving under four and I said but our guys are gonna sit on it. and he said at some point they're gonna have to sell that corn because they need the money and so anyway uh, we'll see where this all plays in so interesting numbers Steve I thought what we would do is just go to the October 11th which was uh, Friday to the Chicago Mercantile Exchange and saying well what are those crooks looking at here and I put three numbers for our listeners to look at first of all is the milk price and uh, the good news is I updated this uh, uh, from the last time I used uh, this and, and the milk price went up about 20 cents a hundred weight but these are pretty scary numbers Steve when you start looking now most of us are probably going to put two dollars on top of this but still eighteen dollar milk is a little nineteen dollar milk pretty iffy here in the midwest in terms of where that milk price is going to be here sits the corn price and our listeners were right on were spot on so maybe they're watching the chicago mercantile exchange but a lot of 450 corn there and soybean meal sitting here at about uh uh, four, uh, four dollar, uh, four hundred dollars a ton. So again, an interesting uh, look at that. Uh, as dairy producers, I know one of the really two of the big time consultants are saying, if you can get if you can get soybean meal under four hundred dollars a ton, you better lock it in. But now these soybean price, soybeans are coming in at a pretty good clip. But his comment was four hundred dollars if you can get it, lock it in. And he was saying this already three months ago. Uh, corn price. He's pretty much uh, saying uh, buying it as needed. And he said, don't lock any milk prices unless you want to lose money. So interesting, Steve, uh, in terms of the marketing uh, aspect of it. I thought for our webinar today we'd look at uh, what I call opportunities. Uh, these are not problems. Uh, only only the Illinois and uh, Chicago Bears football team have problems. We'll call them opportunities today. What about forage availability? And you saw this at a webinar uh, a bit earlier, but uh, at this point, Steve, uh, we're pretty much done harvesting except for that late corn. And so I think all of our dairymen, managers, consultants should uh, be looking at how much is on the farm and can we make it to uh, April if it's uh, if it's going to be a uh, small grain forage, uh, May if it's going to be first crop, uh, or uh, September if it's going to be corn silage. So these are some pretty useful numbers. And we put some kilogram numbers in there as well. Um, and, and that would be uh, how much uh, the amount of, in terms of uh, the metric system, if that's helpful. And again, uh, no hordes. You are not raising your replacements. They're off farm. And so uh, certainly that changes the equation a little bit depending on what you're doing with replacement heifers. So again, pretty useful PowerPoint. I know it's a bit redundant. We've had some calls on corn stocks. Uh, they are out there right now, uh, unless you're in South Dakota where they got all that snow, unfortunately, and we lost some beef uh, beef cattle out there. Uh, corn stocks are a possibility to build inventory. I don't think you're going to be feeding a lot of that to high-producing cows, but older heifers are a tremendous opportunity. In fact, uh, the old the old thumb rule was two-thirds corn stocks, one-third wet distillers grains, and you can raise heifers that are breeding age and above really, really well, along with a good trace mineral program program and mineral program to go with that. So certainly it's a way to extend is our older heifers. I would not feed it to dry cows primarily because I'm a little nervous about the dirt and some of the microtoxins and some of the mole risks we could have. So I would not put it in my dry cow program. We talked about this about six months ago. Uh, it continues to look well. This is the use of calcium oxide to chemically treat corn stocks to make them a bit more digestible. Illinois has looked at some lower levels of 2% to 5%. And uh, again, if you are interested, uh, get a hold of your beef nutritionist because uh, you've got to get this material up to 50% dry matter 
before you put the calcium oxide on. And they told me here at Champagne that if you did not get the moisture uniformly spread and you put the quick lime on, they did have some fires. It would actually catch fire. It gets that hot, it will actually combust. And so be well aware of that. We talk about soil contamination. If you're raking corn stalks, get ready. Uh, your cows will not have a dirt requirement. You will satisfy the dirt requirement. We saw last year a sample in Kentucky running 19% ash. So that's a lot of dirt. And, of course, that takes up a lot of space in the rumen. It also can affect uh, where it sits in the rumen as well. And depending on how you're harvesting it, I know some people are chopping this immediately as the corn pickers are done or the high moisture corn units are coming out and they're actually ensiling it. Uh, some people are uh, taking a flail chopper and flailing it to allow it to dry down to some level and then flailing it again to pick it up. So some people are raking. So lots of different ways of doing this. And, of course, will affect quality of the corn stock. Another one will be straw. And again, nothing terribly new here. Uh, again, we see this working well in, in silage and in, 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 in rations. In fact, we just uh, worked on a very large herd and put in a pound of, of straw and got a very nice response in milk fat test. And that's what we were trying to fix. So you can come through that and take a look at your leisure uh, about the levels. We're saying once you get up to a kilo or a two pounds of, of it, that is a... Um, a real challenge and uh, of course I always recommend if you're going to feed straw uh, to uh, go ahead and add water to it because I think the straw becomes softer uh, less sortable and a little more palatable in the program if you uh, believe and uh, enjoy the Jim Drakeley low energy dry cow rations by the way that is on the webinar uh, in, in the archives of webinars and Steve I, we continue I know to have good use of the archives uh, about eight or ten pounds of the actual straw going in there. Uh, so it's about half straw, half corn silage on the forage side of the equation. If you want more specifics, go to Jim Drakeley's webinar that was hosted last year and you can get much more details on it. Uh, Pat Hoffman said when you get to older heifers, we need to bring some of these materials in, especially if you're going to be feeding much corn silage. And he calls that uh, basically a, a filler, a filler material. And to get older heifers, you could go, if it's the rest of it's going to be high quality corn silage, you could be running as high as uh, uh, 40%. Uh, with a typical alfalfa, corn silage, dairy type forage program, Pat Hoffman uses the figure 20 or 30 percent coming in there to play. Be well aware of microtoxin risks in straw. Uh, this can be a problem depending on how, uh, how you handle that straw. Again, listeners, we welcome your prices. We have uh, one person already is sending a price from Canada, so we'd uh, welcome and uh, appreciate any information we have in your local area. We uh, talked about that when we started the, the webinar. Some of you are going to be picking up some of these forage uh, sources. We'll wrap this up here. If you're going to come in with, uh, uh, with triticale, uh, winter wheat, uh, winter barley in 2014, these are the estimated uh, tonnage from the University of Wisconsin uh, uh, forage group over there. Uh, late planted corn silage. Uh, Steve, we saw yours standing out there. It's going to make that. There's going to be probably three or four tons of dry matter out there. It won't have much as much starch in it as we saw earlier, but certainly it's a feed out there. And I'm sure some of us here in online have got producers or on our farms that use the fall cereal grain. This has primarily been uh, oats, fall oats planted in uh, late August. Uh, if we caught some rain, and on Northern Illinois we did catch some rain, you could be looking at one or two tons there. So certainly these are alternatives looking at uh, the 2013-2000 forage uh, year. And in some cases, we're still planting that, sear uh, that spring or that winter grain. And of course, the other two, either you got it or you don't have it at this point. Well, Steve, we're going to move on to opportunity number two. Opportunity number two has got some new numbers. You've seen these before, so we aren't going to spend a lot of time on it, but let's build your milk check. And I thought we would just come to the University of Illinois. And uh, Steve, I guess you could have done this as well with your uh, jerseys and guernseys up there at Hordes Dairyman. But this is an actual case study from this summer. Uh, we are running a 3.9 milk fat test. That gets us about 22 cents extra compared to the breed average. Uh, because we do have a few jerseys and some brown Swiss uh, in our herd, our true protein is 3.1%. That's going to get us another 23 cents with today's uh, fat and 
in protein prices uh, because uh, our co-op pays a very healthy premium for high quality milk. This is somatic cell. The various bacteria counts. 83 cents is what we picked up per hundred weight. These are all per 100 pounds or 45 kilos. And here we are in central Illinois. Our milk is going into bottling and so we get paid uh, a premium for not using our BST and that's 59 cents. So Steve, you can see about a buck eighty laying on the table here to build our milk check. I thought I would put this up because I went to your August issue 2013 and looked at components. We've talked this at a couple of our other webinars, so I won't walk you through it. And Steve, the thing I found interesting is the jerseys moved. The other breeds did not do much movement at all. Holsteins didn't move an iota, to be honest with it. But the jerseys increased fat and protein slightly. So it looks like uh, the, the, their components are increasing as a breed. And these are DHIR data that would come out of the August 10th issue of Hordes Dairyman. So again, a nice benchmark to look at in terms of are there opportunities. I mean, I simply mean if your Holstein herd is uh, three five and the, uh, the, the true protein is 2.9, I think there's an opportunity there. Again, our colleagues in Canada and Mexico and South America, remember you, this is true protein, so you have to add about 0.18 to 2% or 0.2 to it, which means about a 3.2 would be similar to total or crude protein versus true protein, which is 3.02. That difference is primarily milk, urea, and nitrogen, if you want to be honest about it, and we move on. Jim pulled this together and uh, uh, looks like uh, the kind of sad news, a little bit, Jim. Uh, it came from our, our farm, farm doc, Illinois farm doc, and looking at the relationship of milk price and feed prices. And you can see uh, one of our really good uh, dairy farmers argue with me and says, you know, we want high feed prices because we have high milk prices. And uh, he may be right. He may be right. Notice uh, there are some blips uh, there as well. Notice back in uh, 2012, uh, we had uh, lower milk prices, and yet uh, we looked at the soybean prices and corn prices. Uh, they, they didn't match up very well. But generally, there's an interesting trend there. And so uh, uh, away we go. So I think, Steve, we're in a little bit of trouble. That I think our feed prices will help us, but not enough to offset that dollar loss in milk price. And that's just a Hutchins biased view. So let's take a quick look at feeding metrics. This is going uh, quite quickly. And again, uh, listeners, if you uh, are, uh, want to type in some of your feed prices and feed status in your, in, in Canada, in western part of the United States, uh, eastern part of the United States, we would certainly welcome you to type them in. And we've had a few of them at this point. Let's look at feeding metrics. This is opportunity number three. And uh, these are the prices I used. And my listeners would say my corn price is too high. Uh, the thumb rule on corn silage is 10 times the price of corn. So if you believe that uh, 450 a bushel is the price when you make corn silage, then that's worth $45 per ton. And we're assuming that corn silage will have a about 30% starch and about 33% dry matter and NDF digestibility of around 55 based on 30 hour test. Notice we keep throwing those caveats in because if you have more starch, you should pay and receive more for that corn silage or charge your cows more. If the digestibility is down, then for it's worth a little bit less. So anyway, that's where we're at. I'm right in the middle of the, the, the hunt with the alfalfa hay price, 250 a ton. I used to 450 for soybean meal and my calculations that might be a little bit high, but I just look, uh, we have a colleague from Canada who says that uh, the price up there is 520 for soybean meal. So I got a feeling uh, probably in the eastern and western part of the United States, uh, my number might be too low. Distillers grades is about spot on, right around 250 a ton. If you look at some survey, market survey last week, uh, right about where it should be. I thought, Steve, we'd put this PowerPoint up, just kind of show you 2013 versus 2014 with Hutchins, Hutchins guesstimations listing. And uh, uh, the answer is, uh, look at uh, corn silage down. You can see about $15 a ton. Alfalfa down about uh, $50 a ton. Uh, corn grain down a buck forty a bushel. Fuzzy cotton seed higher. Corn gluten hasn't changed much. Soybean meal a little bit higher compared to what I had it in 2013. Some of you could argue with me on that. And corn distillers grains uh, staying uh, uh, right around uh, uh, that uh, that uh, 180 200 ton. That's unique to Illinois. So I got a feeling if you're in Pennsylvania, you will not get corn distillers quite that cheap at this point. Now. 
Uh, here's the budget. I'm not going to walk you through it. Some of you have seen this before. Notice the bottom line, about $6.18 for that 50 pounds of dry matter. And here's 2014. That works out using my economics. And they might be a little bit high, Steve, but the cost per pound of dry matter is $0.12. Cents. Last year it was $0.13. Cents. So that means that's about a $0.50 or $0.60 cent saving uh, uh, on terms of dry matter going into those cows. You look at uh, the uh, breakdown in high production, 80 pounds versus lower production, 70 pounds. Your feed cost sits around $7.70. That number might be more like $7.50 if I took my lower corn prices into account. Income over feed cost, you can see, sits at about $11. That's what $19 milk. And if you look at the futures, a lot of us is going to be looking at $19 milk, unfortunately. Although, Steve, I found it interesting. Uh, the New Zealand dairy farmers are being paid the equivalent of 20 to 21 dollar milk based on their on their powder and that bodes well because it means that's kind of what they are selling their powder for and that may put a nice floor in for helping us out a little bit later on I think Bob crop is a little bit more bullish than um, the CW uh, Chicago Mercantile change is pretty bearish of course it never changes the feed efficiency at all but if you so it looks like there's 50 or 60 cents a lower uh, feed cost and so per hundred weight that probably is going to give me about 75 cents Steve I'm not sure that's enough when I lose a buck on my milk price in fact I, it's it's not an it's it's probably pretty tight pretty tight it's not going to be a good deal through if you want to look at feed efficiency then and uh, we did this both on a, a kilogram level for our, our metric people you can see with uh, that 12 cents per pound increasing feed efficiency from 1.4 to 1.5 and that's where most herds in the Midwest are going to be sitting uh, there's about 36 cents laying on the table on feed savings because the cow do a bit, does a better job of converting it on over so that takes care of that uh, we got another polling question, Jim. Uh, we got to open the polls up. We thought we'd just throw one in here, uh, just kind of in the middle of the webinar. Uh, it says, for your farm or your clients, which is the greatest opportunity to maintain profitability in 2014? And I'm giving you five choices. There are probably more out there. Uh, increasing milk components and milk quality, which we talked about a little bit earlier. You think that's an opportunity on your farm or with your clients. Increase the level of byproduct feeding. Uh, byproduct feeds, uh, some of them are fairly economical, some are not. Increase the level of home-grown forages. And Steve, you talked a little bit about this. Uh, the quality may not be right there. Uh, reducing shrink on the farm. More about that a little bit later in the webinar. Or increase the number of cows, just milk more cows to try to maintain some profitability. So we've got some voting going on and uh, Steve, uh, we're over 50 percent. Well yes, quick voting today and it uh, will be very interesting to see how this shapes up. Uh, you didn't have one that said all of the above there. Uh, yeah, that's always that, that's always the cheap way out. I've, I discovered that in my <laughs> quizzes that uh, when you yeah. say all the above or none of the above, uh, most people just check that sucker from the automatic. And I yeah. I wanted to make my listeners really think about this and work on it. So uh, we're up to you can uh, see the two of the choices really are leading the way. So yeah, let's in. close it. Uh, looks like nobody else wants to vote with me today. We got a nice attendance. Thanks, folks, for joining us. And you can see the the big winner here is increasing milk components and quality. About a third of you, or forty percent of you, forty percent are said we're just going to feed more homegrown forages so that's kind of interesting Steve any comments uh, that's that's a good tactic if uh, your homegrown forages are of good quality and that's going to be a challenge for some of us that's yeah some, lots I of think. lots of haylage but the quality is not what we would like so now I could have put down increased milk production I mean that would be another one I guess Jim uh, we should have put that in increase more milk production but I think that's kind of a slam dunk everybody would have picked that but it's interesting about uh, eight percent of you picked up uh, more byproducts uh, reduce shrink or increase cow numbers let's come back to those and in, in just a minute okay opportunity number four uh, and uh, we've got a few questions coming in we welcome that we'd like to have more input any of you folks on the East Coast like to kind of know what your feed prices and feed availability is going to look like any of our listeners from California Arizona Idaho we'd love to have you to also type in some information and tell us kind of what's uh, what's what's going on okay uh, forage form uh, quickly let's talk a word about that 
uh, trying to visualize the room and map. To, uh, that's a fun visual that to uh, take a look at. And we put this on a form for two reasons. One, some farmers are going to feed less hay uh, just because it's too expensive. They're not going to buy that hay or the hay quality is low enough that they're just not going to put that much into the feeding program. So if we look at that, I thought we'd come back to kernel processing and Jim uh, found a couple of these PowerPoints for me here. Uh, this simply shows a way to uh, determine the actual uh, score. Uh, this is a chopping score, which is based on a sieving procedure that goes through a 4,400 millimeter screen. And ideally, uh, more of it should go through. If over 70% of your starch drops through that coarser screen, the good news is that it should be more fermentable and digestible both in the rumen and fermentability and digestibility in the lower tract. And this is a kind of a classic study uh, uh, pulled together and I'm going to show you some more data from Randy Shaver. You can see that as far as optimal uh, you can see in the green over there uh, and a pretty nice database about 400 samples you can see about 18 percent about 18 percent were in the green uh, if, you're, if you're going to use a cutoff score of, of 70, then that number drops down a little bit. But you can see 21% of it were, uh, were under-processed and another 60% were kind of in the blue area. Tremendous opportunity, but Steve, it's too late to talk about that now, but let's just show you the impact. Randy Shaver pulled this data together. I want to give Randy credit for that. And you can see uh, uh, a number of different studies, uh, including the one we just had there. Uh, these are are three big three big labs: Cumberland Valley, Rock River, and Dairyland Labs. You can see the year, the number of samples, and again, we continue to have a fair number of poor, or certainly not excellent, not excellent uh, occurring as well. Now, why is that so important? Well, Dr. Shaver put this slide together and said, if you are an adequate, which would be that 50% adequate, you can see had you moved up to the excellent category, that would get you about two pounds more milk. And of course, those folks that are in that poor category, they're giving up two pounds of milk. So there's four pounds of milk laying on the table if we get our kernel processing done right. And we talked a bit about that earlier. So let's say a few words about shredlage. We can talk more about that a bit later. And the good news, I believe, Steve, that uh, Randy is going to be on uh, in 2014 in one of our webinars, and I'm sure That's he's right. going to update this information and give us the latest. He seems to be doing most of the research. This is some uh, work uh, Jim found out of a um, uh, newsletter, and that processor is going to cost about $30,000 to install. Uh, about $25 an hour extra to cover the extra fuel and other costs. And so uh, that came out of Michigan State and now is being cited in this reference. And again, you can go to that reference and look it up at your leisure. Uh, the the Shredlage group is recommending uh, you charge about two dollars, a buck and a half, two dollars more, a ton more to run the, the Shredlage versus a conventional type unit. Uh, usually what was happening, the conventional units, Steve, we heard about a dollar, a dollar ten per, uh, per ton for for doing a doing kernel processing, so you can see we'd add another buck and a half on top of that. Uh, the 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 um, people that uh, are kernel processing get pretty nervous because they're just afraid that producers just will refuse to pay this price. These ro rollers will wear out, and uh, according to that news release Jim uh, found for us, you can see that uh, you're going to have to replace these because just like the uh, normal kernel processors, they will they will wear out. So what are we looking for? Well, if you look at corn silage on the bottom, these are our guidelines. They're a little more aggressive than Penn State, but this would be kernel process or three quarter of an inch theoretical length of chop. And if that corn is over 33, 34 percent dry matter, we're rolling at one millimeter. We really are crushing the corn kernels, really crushing. So we'd like to see somewhere in that 12 to 14 percent on the top box. The kernel processor will get you over 30. And that is some work that's been done by uh, a couple consultants and also by Randy. So uh, a processor, this will be 30. This number will drop down to more like about 20. So what's happening is the, pr the processor, uh, the shredlage, is moving this 50% down and putting it in the top box. The good news is that if you are feeding some straw or some hay, will that allow you to take that out of the ration? And again, I, I think we uh, use a term with one of my colleagues, you know, what's the fragility? How fragile is that? 
or another word is the word prickly. How prickly is is that corn sage going to be? And if it's a really soft corn sage, will it have the same cud chewing stimulation that say a uh, stemmy alfalfa hay or haylage and or a say a, a, a straw would bring to the party? So again, you can take a look at at these numbers. So if I had a shredlage number down there, I guess Jim, I guess I could have put that in. This would be more like 30 and this would be more like maybe about 20 because these numbers will add up uh, to be about the same. This one adds up to 65 and if this one was 30, this one would be probably more like 35. And of course that is of interest as well. What about uh, buying feed opportunities? We do have choices here as well. And again, being a little redundant, but we updated the data for you. Uh, this is FeedVal 2012. Uh, we talked about that. Uh, uh, Victor Cabrera talked about it. Uh, in fact, it's on a webinar. If you want to go back to his webinar last year, you can go back and review that. He did talk a little bit more detail on, on FeedVal. Uh, when I ran this, and you'll see the data here, I used bypass protein or RUP. I used energy. I used uh, starch. I used lipid. And I used NDF. So I, those are the five variables I selected to run FeedVal 2012. And we had much of these same feeds listed in there. And this is September 2013, reflecting the number. So here's my corn. I stuck in it at $5 a bushel. If you believe corn is going to be 450 or 425, then you have to download FeedVal 2012 and uh, put this in at 450 because that will make a difference. So everything in green, Steve, means they're good buys. So you can see at $5 a bushel, Feed Val 2012, but ran in 2013. That's a little mistake. I should make that a 12, Jim, but that's okay. You can see that shell corn and corn silage is a good price. I put it at $50 a ton. If some of you want to put that in at $45, you can. Straw, I put in at $120 a ton. And you can see it has a, well, I guess I couldn't have made that one white. It's kind of a push. So a straw is worth about $120 a ton. Uh, corn stalks, a little overpriced at $80 a ton. I remember from our last webinar, I said about half of this, about $35 a ton, is going to be the fertility value and whatever the cost it is to pick it up. So we, we said $40 a ton to pick it up, bale it, uh, flail it, chop it, whatever you're going to do, and then $30, uh, $40 of fertility value uh, sit, sitting there as well. Here, a catch, look at your eye. Here's your 250 a ton hay, and my computer says it's worth 176 that's pretty much hardball. We're not looking at effective fiber, cud chewing, um, room and mat, any of that stuff. It's simply hardball. It simply says with all these different feeds, you can see high quality and average quality alfalfa is overpriced in today's market. We then did some byproduct feeds. And so uh, distillers grains, we put them in at 250. That might be a little high in Illinois, but certainly probably correct for some other parts of, of the United States and Canada. Uh, break even 360. Corn gluten, 150 I put in. You could lock that number in last week here in Illinois. If corn prices come down, there's an opportunity that these might come down as well, depending on uh, the supply and demand, as we'd say. Here's sit your fuzzy cotton seed. Notice soy holes are a push. Uh, fuzzy cotton seed, uh, 330 uh, I put it in at 330 That's probably a little bit low. Break even, 264 264 And my beet pulp, you can see, is not a good buy either. Wheat mids at this price is a push that came off the Wisconsin spreadsheet and soy holds also at 185 are push, which means they're not super buys, but they're not uh, overpriced either at this point. Again, <clears throat> how do you find that tool? Uh, again, these are the, uh, the website you can go to, but uh, Victor's uh, website has enough hits that if you type in feed val, small case, I don't think it's case sensitive, 2012, it will come right up. It will come right up and you can run this on your, uh, on your farm or for your clientele. Very helpful. You can go in and select the feeds you want to use, the price you want to use, the quality of the forages you're putting in there, and of course, which nutrients are you going to focus on. And I emphasize that because for dry cows or heifers, by and large, I'd be looking at two of them. Uh, crude protein and uh, energy. Um, don't need a lot of bypass protein for growing heifers or dry cows. I don't need a lot of starch for those animals. I don't need any extra fat for those animals. So again, a, a little different strategy in terms of uh, looking at the uh, break-even. 
Our last opportunity before, and we're going to be done a bit earlier here today, Steve, which is probably good for your schedule and mine. Uh, these are what we call uh, opportunity number six. We call them free feed. And actually, I picked this up from Larry Chase at a seminar about a year ago, and I think it's a neat concept. Free feed says feed that you don't have to buy because you already either raised it or you're feeding it. I think one of the big ones is right here on top, and that is looking at waybacks. And uh, we have tightened this down, uh, Steve, down to about 1% or 2% waybacks. This is feed that is put in the bunk, but the cows do not consume it, and it is pushed out and then either uh, fed to steers or fed to older heifers uh, or basically discarded as, as waste and put back on the land as, as, as fertilizer. Uh, 1% or 2% is where we'd like to be, and then we would also run the Penn State box on that way back, and the various fractions, top, middle, and bottom box, should be plus or minus 5%, uh, trying to answer or address the question sorting going on. If you start looking at feeding losses, Steve, this is just amazing, amazing number. Forages, uh, feeding losses can be... Uh, uh, this is reducing the feed loss, not feeding, I should say feed loss. This includes in the field, uh, in storage, during fermentation, in case of forages, if it's silages, and then out of feed out time. Look at the number here, Steve. This number can be as high as 35%. So we've raised this very high quality corn silage and, or forage, and we only get, uh, we, we, we leave a third of it somewhere along the line. Uh, the five percent, basically, that's your fermentation loss. It means no molding that's going to occur there. Uh, we're not going to have any uh, excessive fuel losses occurring, so that probably reflects uh, silage chopping. Uh, so that's a pretty low number. Concentrates. The only way you and I can get there, Steve, is if we have this probably in some type of an auger leg vertical feeding system. Uh, most of our bins will have uh, losses due to uh, wind and birds and rodents that's going to approach this, uh, this, this, this 10 percent figure. Byproduct feeds can be very variable depending again on how you store them, if they come in wet, how much seepage that's going to run out of those uh, byproduct feeds. And I know Steve, we were looking at your wet brewer pit we were on the farm and you folks are feeding wet brewer's grain and uh, there, there's going to be some loss there and there's just no yep. question. Uh, that 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 that's just going to happen because it's 80 percent water and it it weeps for lack of a better word. Of course, the other thing is some of the environmental factors. Uh, uh, you know, if it happen to rain tonight and tomorrow, uh, some of that feed's going to get wet, especially in feed bunks. Uh, we discovered here at the University of Illinois our feed bunks are pretty uncovered, and as a result, when we get a rain episode, uh, cows don't like sloppy feed. They just don't eat feed, and that really causes some problem. The wind is just amazing. Uh, we had a chance to be on some farms in north and uh, west in, in New Mexico, uh, the Clovis area, and uh, when it's 25 mile winds and you're dropping in shell corn into your TMR mixer, let me tell you, you are now sending corn to some place east. Who knows how far it went? We really struggle at Champagne with birds, especially blackbirds. They really raise cane with our bags, and so uh, we have moved to a. Um, to a, a silage pile this year. That also has some risks of bird damage, but we're going to see if that reduces that. And of course, the ever risk of mold formation in the top two or three feet of our, of our piles and bunkers. So certainly, uh, there's a thumb rule from one of our nutritionists who say eight or ten percent of the feed that is uh, that that is that was growing on the farm never gets into the mouth or the muzzle of the dairy cow. And that's an awfully big figure. With today's feed prices, tomorrow's feed prices, or last year's feed prices, 8 to 10 percent is huge. Uh, he used a number of about 22 cents per cow per day. That's an awfully big number, Steve. So let's look at two ways to get some of this free feed. It's too late now for most of us, and unless uh, we got some of this immature corn out there. But certainly, in our view, as a slam dunk, uh, you've got to have side inoculants. If you don't have them there, and we saw this uh, six months ago in one of our webinars, we were talking about trying to retain nutrients on the farm. 3% uh, recovery, that's the Washington State data in terms of a good inoculant, 2% improvement in digestibility, which means we ferment that feed quicker and it cools down quicker. We don't lose as much dry matter uh, or, or digestible dry matter. That is Washington State data. And then if you feed that to high-producing cows, then you can get a ratio 
of about eight to one. That is some Kansas State work done by Keith Volson's group there. If you take those saved nutrients and extra dry matter, put it through a cow, the payback is eight to one, assuming you paid a dollar for your inoculant to put it on to preserve the feed. Another one that's getting a lot of good traction is oxygen barrier covers. Uh, there are several now on the market. Uh, Silo Stop certainly is one of the more common ones, one of the first ones that came on. But there are several more products out there now that either you can cover with plastic. A couple companies have an additive that you will put on your last loads of feed, which will actually in, uh, reduce the dry matter loss in that top one or two feet of feed. So certainly uh, look at the dry matter losses that you can have there, uh, as much as 50% in the top foot or two. Uh, the people that use these oxygen barriers, a very specific product that retards oxygen penetration, and you can see another 2 or 5% savings. So Steve, free feed, we said, you know, if, if you would pre put an inoculant on, you might get about a 3%, 4% there. If you put a, if you're in piles or, or bunkers, you might get another 2 or 3% there. You know, if you do a careful job at feed out and mixing, so your guys are doing an accurate job of mixing the right amounts of feed in there, and we're not tracking and losing too much feed by overfeeding or running it over a tractor, you, there, there's, we just found 7 or 8% of feed sitting out there right on the farm. Okay, so now we're going to open it up. Uh, we have five minutes left for our webinar here and says what's happening uh, in your area. And so far we've only got one Canadian that's uh, responded and we certainly would welcome any comments from my listeners. And we've got uh, over 80 of you online at one time here. Uh, Steve, w what's your take in Wisconsin? What, what, what are you seeing in terms of a feed, a feed quality, feed prices, stuff like that? Well, what's uh, happening right around here is that there's a lot of beans being combined here in the last few days. So that's moving along uh, pretty good. I have not been hearing reports on yields uh, per se, but it looks like a pretty decent uh, decent crop. Uh, chop corn silage wise, we're pretty well all chopped off except for some late corn. Uh, we can identify here at the Orange Dairyman Farm with your comment about having about three different corn crops. Certainly we had a June planting and actually uh, some July planting and we'll be chopping some of that late corn soon and then uh, the corn that we're saving for combining is drying down pretty nicely now and we're ex hoping for some pretty good yields uh, on that. Uh, so uh, price-wise, I'm not sure that I can shed a lot of light onto it. I think uh, most generally speaking people in at least the southern part of the state where there wasn't so much winter kill We'll have lots of, of hay, hay silage uh, available. Again, as you made a comment earlier, the quality is questionable, especially some of that first cutting. So there's going to be lots of haylage, but it's going to need to have some uh, some protein and some uh, and some uh, energy, uh, plenty of energy to go with it. Uh, we ourselves have chopped uh, about 100 acres of corn silage and really had uh, phenomenal yields, actually 31 tons. We won't be getting that much uh, on our later cuttings, of course, and we have not had it analyzed as to starch content yet. But that's kind of where we are uh, right now, uh, Mike. Just a comment uh, before we see if some other folks might be weighing in here. Well, I don't know if this came up when you were at our farm, but we did have an incident with an employee and silo gas on bags. I used to think that silo gas problems was a pretty much of an upright deal, but it is possible uh, to get some pretty strong whiffs of silo gas uh, when you're closing up a uh, sealing off a corn silage bag that uh, was scary. We think we kind of dodged a bullet on it, but uh, uh, that's possible, and for those of you who are, might be doing it yourself or have some clients, uh, just a little word that uh, you need ventilation and somebody around maybe when you're doing that final sealing of the of, of the end of the silo bag. So, Mike, that's it for me for now, and maybe there'll be some others that uh, you can report on here in a minute. Go ahead. Yeah, very good, Steve. Appreciate your willingness to do that for us. Illinois, just uh, you pretty much heard all our biases on prices here. Uh, lots of 200 bushel corn coming in. Uh, so a big, big yields coming in from Illinois. Our soybeans are running 50 to 60 bushel, and that surprised a lot of people. That was a news release that came from uh, uh, from our farm farm uh, farm bureau newspaper. 
as well. So you've already seen what's happening here. Uh, we're we're about 60% of the corn and 60% of the beans in. So the beans are coming in, as Steve points out, very aggressively. Uh, we do have some input coming from Canada. Uh, let's uh, just uh, report that uh, back at this point. We've got uh, uh, corn silage, uh, they're saying, uh, is uh, pretty well done. 60, 65% moisture, so a little on the dry side. Soybeans, about 14 to 16% done. Um, we have a, I think these are all coming from Canada, are they not? Uh, Jim, I'm just looking quickly. Uh, soybean meal, uh, 400, uh, excuse me, $520 a U.S. ton. That's 540 for a Canadian long ton at this point. And he is, and it's going up, and it's going up in price from a, a colleague up there in Canada. Um, we're uh, corn uh, again uh, up in Canada around uh, two hundred dollars a ton uh, at harvest. Uh, that is, uh, we're assuming that's dry corn, and with a fifty-six cent bushel, that's about five sixty a bushel. If my math is right, uh, again uh, reflecting that same soybean price from another colleague in Canada, five hundred fifty dollars for the Canadian ton. Distillers around uh, three fifty a ton. Corn gluten feed at three hundred dollars a ton. Wow. We amazing, amazing. Uh, corn silage uh, sitting around fifty dollars a ton, and just lots of variation in quality and in uh, in quantity. Iowa has now voted. Uh, corn size twenty five ton uh, a yield on the corn silage, one hundred eighty six bushel corn and soybean and soybeans at sixty one bushel. Iowa, you're sitting on a big crop. Iowa's sitting in a big crop. Jim is a rapidly. Um, uh, th throwing some numbers up here. The corn price, uh, we'll go back and take care of that for you, Jim. The corn price, we say 45 to $50 a ton, that includes uh, chopping, inoculation, and covering in the bag, or in the pile, or in the bunker, or in the silo, wherever you want to go. So we talk 45 or $50 a ton. The thumb rule 10 to 1 will cover all those sins. You saw us uh, go back to one of our webinars on pricing corn silage. Um, we have a formula where you can actually back into it and I prefer uh, to do that as well. Okay, no other votes coming in here. Uh, we have another question. I planted a new hay field using oats as a cover crop. Planted, uh, planted late due to too much precipitation. The hay grew awesome. How would you harvest it? I'm thinking about round baling it all. The hay is thick and green, and I assume the oats is still in there. Uh, I'm assuming you maybe want to come in. So I think you've got it right. I would harvest it all, uh, especially now that we're in October. Now, where are you at? I think that's an Illinois question, I think. Anyway, uh, David, where are you? Just make sure we, uh, if you want to type that in, where are you at this point? Uh, Wisconsin. I should know that you're in my class. Uh, um, Oconto, Wisconsin. Uh, I, would, I would take that. Uh, when uh, you are pretty comfortable that the, the, the temperatures are going to stay very close to that uh, 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 into that 30 degree range because we don't want that new seeding coming back uh, with you, but uh, I, I, I would take it. You're going to have to get that to dry down. What scares me is that stuff could be easy, 75% uh, moisture if more, and boy, wrapping that up in a round bale. I like the round bale, but uh, I, gee, I, I wish we could get that up uh, drier, up to say 35 or 40% dry matter. That may be wishful thinking now in the middle of October. So you may want to pull the trigger on that pretty quickly. I don't know if we got an agronomist coming in here uh, in terms of uh, wondering if we're going to, uh, will that stand be okay? But if, if, if it's got an awful big crop and you're sitting up there, I'd, I'd be nervous if, if it's, you know, standing uh, 12 inches or higher of it just flattening straight down. Um, yes, very good, Patty. Mike, while you're, uh, yes, while you're digesting some of those later questions and comments, let me uh, kind of do a little bit of a wrap up here in our uh, remaining minutes. I want to thank you uh, for your usual great job. We appreciate uh, all you do and the, uh, all the information that you provide so rapidly and so clearly uh, for us. And also we wanted to thank the uh, sponsors of today's webinar, Gen Pro Performance Minerals. We appreciate that. For those of you uh, listening, uh, for those who have been with us before, a reminder that there will be a survey 
they'll reach you in your emails sometime here in the next few days. Uh, and uh, for the new people, uh, look for those. Just a few minutes of your time will help us a lot in planning future webinar uh, uh, presentations. Also, all of the webinars, including today's after a couple of days, all the past webinars are available uh, free for your archive use anytime. Uh, that you want. We've had uh, about 28,000 archive views of webinars passed now over the last uh, two and three quarters years, something like that. So they do get a lot of use. And looking ahead, next month's webinar is going to be uh, presented by the popular speaker Gary Sipiorski uh, with VitaPlus, and it will be brought to us uh, from Danisco Animal Nutrition. That's going to be on November 11th, it's going to be a kind of a year-end farm, year farm financial business checkup by Gary Sipiorski. And then looking ahead another month, December 9th, the Corn Growing Basics. And we all, uh, lots, we've, we've all made great progress in our uh, corn, uh, corn growing, but uh, Joe Lauer from the University of Wisconsin is going to put it all together and give us a good update on that, and that's going to be brought by Kuhn North America. So, Mike, uh, with those comments, are, are there some other questions or comments that you've received in, in the last uh, couple of minutes? Yeah, we have a couple more comments, but let's go back one more PowerPoint. I, my apologies to Patty and Steve. I violated all the rules of our webinar. Well, um, we got it all in. We, we, we're okay. Um, uh, P Patty provided this this uh, over uh, uh, this PowerPoint and simply says we do have some other support material available through the Hordes Dairyman Library. They do sell a number of publications. These are four in the feeding area. Uh, the feed guide, which is both in English and Spanish, you see it listed up there under A and. Uh, there as well. Uh, B is the Advanced Dairy Nutrition CD. By the way, that class will be offered again starting in early January. You'll be seeing more about that hopefully in the Hordes Dairy Magazine. Uh, you can buy that uh, package of a CD plus the feeding guide. Uh, then we have another one on successful feeding systems, uh, looking at different ways of delivering feed to cows, and then forage management for dairy. And that's the newest one of the uh, of the suite of ones we have here. There's also one on transition cow that's done with a veterinarian colleague as well. So those are other tools you could be looking at as well. So and again, should, let's just go ahead, Steve. Mike, I just want to jump in. I should mention to people that uh, Mike Hutchins had a great hand in all of those publications. And so if you appreciate uh, the knowledge and uh, expertise he has, uh, these books would be a good way for you to take a closer look at that uh, as your uh, time and schedules permit. Go ahead. Okay, well, very good. Well, we have a couple more questions here. Let's finish up our wrap-up here. I, I think our last ones came from Iran, and they're looking at $600 a ton for soya and corn size at $53 uh, uh, per ton, but that's 24% dry matter, so that makes it probably worth about $70 on, a, on our, our basis over here. And then milk uh, sitting at $370 per ton, and I'll let you work that back. That would be about... Uh, uh, about 15, 16 cents per pound. So uh, you can you can work that backwards if you wish. Uh, just a comment from a Minnesota, uh, Illinois colleague. Be careful about trashing alfalfa hay. Nobody wants to raise it to sell at a, such a low price. I understand. That's a good comment. A lot of cheap uh, hay the cows won't eat and they won't give much milk. So uh, good comments. Just really good comments. But you know, Feed valve 2012 and Sesame really doesn't care. All they're simply looking at cost of the nutrient uh, in, in the program. Uh, then we have one more here. Um, it says, if corn silage is not optimally processed, what changes need to be made to improve it next year? How often do processor rules need to be replaced? Um, I, I think if you look back to, uh, you got to check. You got to check with your your dealer. Uh, it depends how many acres you're putting through. So I I know the person who asked the question. And uh, again, if if you're only processing like the University of Illinois, just processing our 200 cows and heifer corn silage, we will not have to replace that roller as quickly. Uh, the the big herds that are doing some custom work, they said every year. They're putting new rollers in every year. Their theory is if they, if your processor is not grabbing the corn size, it's not quite as grabby, for lack of a better word, then you probably are needing to either get them retooled or replace the rollers. That gentleman said buy the new rollers. By the time you get them reprocessed and regrooved, uh, the cost and then the, the, they're not nearly as aggressive or as good as the original, you probably go 
with that. So again, uh, what changes need to be improved next year? Uh, you may have to put uh, rollers in, in and uh, you have to be looking at uh, the how tight can you run, can you crush the corn, can you crush the corn. And, uh, I, and I know Dr. Shaver is quite as aggressive as I am, but I really don't want to see any kernels at all in the corn silage. I, I really want them crushed and uh, have them gone uh, at this point. So anyway, I think, Jim, uh, that take care of all our questions, all our comments. Steve, we're going to sign off. I want to okay. thank you again. Uh, Zimpro for their sponsorship and Steve will turn it back to you to wrap it up. Well, thank you uh, again. Uh, our thanks to Zimpro and their sponsorship. Mike, again, our thanks to you for uh, a very timely, uh, informative webinar. Thanks to Jim Baltz, your sidekick back there at the University of Illinois who provides a lot of information for these PowerPoints and then makes uh, the things happen mechanically. Thanks for all of you out there who joined us today. Hope you're back with us November 11th to hear Gary Sipiorski talk about a year-end financial checkup. That's it for now. Thanks for your uh, participation. Mike, so you're running to the airport. Oop, I think I muted myself. I did. Uh, Mike already left for the airport. <laughs> Mike, he's already left for the airport? Well, <laughs> okay. And I'm, I'm heading to the farm uh, for a tour of uh, some folks from uh, Latvia. So, and uh, it's a nice day. I don't mind at all being outside there on that farm. So, Jim, thanks for your help as always. I'm sorry I didn't get to see you during Expo, but uh, uh, I'm sure our paths will cross again before too long. So, all right. Have a great Sign day. In. I'm signing out here. Thank you. Take care.